yes, excellent, excellent. Right, well, uh, Dave normally does the introductions, but seeing as Dave is hosting this week, by the way, I should say, uh, for those who aren't here for the uh, Sporting Lunchtime Lecture, you're in for an absolute treat. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the latest in our series of Sporting Lunchtime Lectures, whereby before selected Bradford City games, uh, we have a Sporting Lunchtime Lecture. It's not always football, it can be had archaeology, we've had uh, South America, we've had all sorts of different sports, cricket, rugby, all the sports, probably four. Um, and uh, today we've got Dave Pendleton, who normally does this bit, but it would be wrong for him to introduce himself. So Dave is talking, um, here we go, the projector. We borrowed this from the IMAX uh, cinema, by the way. We need to take this back afterwards. Um, not just birds, uh, not just bird, uh, booze, birds and books. It's the North American Soccer League, 1960. Oh, oh that's a good start, isn't it? Uh, 1968 to 1984. So without further ado, please welcome uh, Dr. David Pendleton. Here we go. Here we go. It's just like, uh, just like Parker, just like, a, just like Rusty Hearted. Here we go. Over to you, Dave. Uh, that's a comedy moment over. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> right, then, the North American Soccer League. A lot of you probably know that my daughter, Rosie, lives in Orlando, Florida. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time over in America. And I wanted to give you a talk about the Major League Soccer and the, the fan culture, because it's really quite fascinating. But the more I looked into the history of the MLS, the more I realised I had to tell you the story first of the North American Soccer League because the MLS is everything that the NASL isn't. So you'll have to get used to some acronyms, by the way, as we go through this. Let's just nail one thing first, soccer. Some people like to um, have a bit of a go at the Americans uh, because they use the word soccer as if it's some kind of, these people can't even say football correctly, what's going on? If you read Victorian newspapers, which I unfortunately have done many, many times down in the Central Library, you will see through the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, you'll see football at the top of, a, of all the sports reports. Football means rugby, 100% rugby all the time. And then you'll eventually see the association game appear. And then after 1895, you'll also see the Northern Union game appear, and that means rugby league, of course. And the association game, of course, is as what we know as football, what we would call football, but the Victorians called it the association game, and then started calling it soccer, with a K, by the way just to differentiate it between readers from the rugby game, which was the overarching game. So guess what? The Americans use the word soccer now because... We're having problems again. Uh, we, they use the word soccer to differentiate from the NFL. Otherwise, if you write football in America at the moment, the vast majority of people will think you're talking about the NFL or gridiron. So all the Americans are doing is doing what we did in this country in the 1870s, 80s and 90s. So it's not, it's not actually a very good... Um, Insult, if, it, if that's what it can be called. Just a brief run through the history of American, American soccer, so I'll call it soccer from now on, just to stop messing around. It's a really, really old game. The 1850s is the first mention of football in America in New Orleans. I went back to football then, didn't I? <laughs> Bear with me, guys. Uh, one Eder of Boston are playing in 1862. Now, Bradford FC, who were the precursors of Bradford Park Avenue, one of the oldest football stroke rugby clubs in Britain were formed the year after in 1863. The Football Association was formed the year after in 1863. So you can see it's quite an old game. One Eder were playing what they called the Boston game, which was a bastardised version of football and rugby, which is exactly what Bradford FC were playing up at Park Avenue. It, to modernise, it wouldn't be rugby and it wouldn't be football. It'd be a while before the two games actually properly separate. And indeed, in the case of Bradford, if they played away at Sheffield, they would play a game known as under the Sheffield rules, which were more like soccer. And when Sheffield came to Bradford, they would alter their game to play Bradford under more like a more rugby style rule. So it's a, it's a very mixed bag. It's, it's really interesting. 1884, the American Football Association, Association appears. And then a really interesting uh, thing is the National Association of Football League in 1895. This is started by baseball owners. The baseball owners are looking for something for their uh, teams to do in the winter. It's just like cricket teams in England and, and in Britain, that they're looking for something to use their grounds, to keep the players fit, to bring some income in during the winter. And that's exactly what the baseball people are doing. Now, something that's real, I, I think that's, it needs a bit more research, but William McGregor of Aston Villa, who forms the Football League, it's always been said 
that one of his big influences was the baseball league in America because he had a lot of commercial interests in America, so he'd go backwards and forwards all the time. The other argument is county cricket, but I think that the baseball one's a stronger argument. He, he sets up the, um, the British Baseball League in the 1890s, which Aston Villa had a team in. So there's clearly a link going on here, and I, I, I need to get to the bottom of that one, but anyway, I haven't at the moment. The National Challenge Cup starts in 1914 in America. It's still going as the Open Cup, and the current uh, the current holders are Orlando City, which I'm delighted to, delighted to tell you about that. My daughter was at the final when they won, so that's great stuff. And the American Soccer League starts in 1921. This is where things get really, really interesting. In the 1920s, soccer was the biggest sport in America apart from baseball. Far bigger than gridiron, which really hadn't got going at that point. But then a soccer war, what they call a soccer war, appears in the 1920s, uh, sort of 24 to about 33. And it's because they're quite innovative, the, um, the American Soccer League. They come up with all sorts of really good ideas. I'll read some out to you because you won't be able to see at the back. And this brings them into conflict with the FIFA, um, UEFA, and also the US FA themselves. They have no maximum wage. And this, this, this means that European players are, are, are enticed to break their contracts and come and play football, soccer in America. Two substitutes per game. We didn't do that in England until 1965. They're thinking Sidbins. Well, we thought about that, wouldn't we? That, there was a big talk about Sidbins in the 80s, wasn't there? Goal line judges. Well, the UEFA tried that one, didn't they? <laughs> didn't them guys with, with no flags at the end. Uh, Kickings instead of throw ins. Uh, that's never really been a good thing. Four 20 minute quarters. Offside only in the penalty area. That was actually talked about in this country when we did away with the back pass to the goalkeeper. It was one of the, one of the rules they were talking about. They were going to move back the penalty spot for you as to give the keeper a bit more chance. There was a talk in this country as well in the I think it was in the 1980s of making the goals bigger, because when goals were when the size of goals were set, goalkeepers were probably the same height as I am. Most goalkeepers now are considerably taller than I am. So, you know, Harry Lewis, uh, six foot four, whatever it is, and a winter break to facilitate an indoor competition because some of the winters, obviously, in, in in the northern part of the United States, are quite brutal. And this actually comes back to bite the NASL in the 1980s because indoor soccer, which is a really interesting subject in itself, becomes quite a big thing in America. So we're also, sorry, I've jumped on one there. I haven't finished what I'm talking about. Um, so what happens is in the 19, you've got the Wall Street crash. They sort all this out, by the way. They sort it all out with the, with the uh, USFA. Two weeks after they sort it all out and everybody thinks, oh, everything's sorted. Wall Street crash comes along. And what happens then is the baseball owners kind of, pull back a bit on their expenditure. So the first thing they ditch is, is obviously the soccer sections. The same thing happens, you think of our, our lovely neighbours Leeds United when they got relegated, um, they, they immediately bin the women's team. And it's, it's in some respects, it's, it's a very similar sort of pulling back to your core values. And that happens. And also in the 1930s in America, you've got the politics of isolationism. So you've got the rise of American exceptionalism. And therefore, a game that's seen as a foreign game, as an immigrant game, is probably not as appealing to some of the more radical elements of the US politics. And the NFL comes in right on the back of this. You know? And it's, it's a really interesting uh, mix-up of, of cultures. And then we've got to jump forward. 1950 happens, of course. USA beat England 1-0 in the, in the World Cup in, in, uh, in Brazil. But it's even in America, when you read current uh, American uh, sports histories, they, they dismiss it as a fluke. That's been kind of revisited, to be honest. But they do dismiss it as a fluke. College soccer, by the way, keeps going all the way through this. But professional soccer kind of just collapses and doesn't recover until the 1960s. Now, remember Paul? I, give, I told Paul off when he was talking about Douglas Prague because he started talking about the USA. Well, here's Douglas Prague in 1961 winning the International Soccer League. Um, West Ham United also won it in 1963. But... What's happening is they're importing teams into the US to play competitions. And it kind of, it's reinforcing this idea that this isn't an American game. It's an immigrant game, it's, 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 a, it's the other. So it's hard to make inroads into wider American culture and the, and the newspapers just won't pick up on this sort of thing at all. And the, this gets reinforced by the United States Soccer Association in 1967. Again, Doug will soon get off these really detailed slides. But you will be see this, so I'll read them out to you. And these are British and uh, the South American teams pretended to be something they're not. 
So, for example, Boston Rovers are Shamrock Rovers. Uh, Chicago Mustangs are Calgary. Uh, the Cleveland Stokers are actually Stoke City. That's, that's not a bad one. The Dallas Tornado are Dundee United. The Detroit Cougars are Belfast Glen Toran. The Houston Stars are Bangor, Brazil. The Los Angeles Wolves are Wolves. Yeah, well done. Uh, the New York Skyliners of Cerro of, of Uruguay, and this is this is the best one. The San Francisco Golden Gate Gales, <laughs> give us an S, no, don't one, are actually Dan Hag. Toronto of Herbernian, Vancouver Royal Canadians are Sunderland, and the Washington Whips are Aberdeen. So this is just kind of completely reinforcing this idea that this this is it's not an American game, it's something something else altogether. Oh, by the way, the first Super Bowl. Happens in 1967. So again, you can see this rise, real rise of the NFL at the same time that soccer is in an awful lot of problems in the US. And there's a program, by the way, from the Detroit Cougars against the Dallas Tornado or Glen Torren against Dundee United for those <laughs> more interested. Interesting to see how many people have well, Not many, by the looks, not many people turned up. But anyway. So what changes everything? Well, believe it or not, the 1966 World Cup changes everything in America. They a lot of the matches are streamed live, particularly to the East Coast, because the time zones kind of work. The, P the FIFA film, Goal, is shown in American cinemas, and a million people watch it. And this grabs the attention of the Americans, and particularly of some of the more commercially-minded, sports-minded Americans who think, hang on a minute, perhaps it's time we revisited this game and had another look at it. So it's quite ironic that England win the World Cup as a boost to the Americans. So off the back of it comes the North American Soccer League, the NASL, which we now, in the minds, I will think, of an excess hyperber hyperbole of um, aging stars going to America to grab a few extra pounds. All those stereotypes, some of which are true, some of which aren't. Quite a lot aren't, actually. And he gets off to a really poor start in 1968. It looks like all the Americans are going to do is repeat the, the mistakes of uh, previous years because they're just in poor en masse. Um, lower league players from, from mainly from Britain actually, a hell of a lot of players go, but we'll, we'll see this again in a moment. And it's it's not that great. And, and people start thinking, well, there, there is something more in this. And the Boston Minutemen signed Eusebio in 1975. And this is the start of a massive change because suddenly the American media wake up to the idea that somebody as good as Eusebio is on, is on their shores. And by the way, the player next to Eusebio is Roy Ellum. Sent out for Bradford City between 1961 and 66. I'll have to look in my notes to see how many games he actually played. 149 appearances for Bradford City. So, again, this is a great um, illustration of what the NSL is. So you've got these big stars who appear, but at, at the backbone of the NSL is basically a lot of journeyman footballers. And there's there's good old Roy Allen, um, who, like I said, played an awful lot of games at the Valley Parade. But the big breakthrough is Pelé. Pelly comes to the New York Cosmos, he's attracted by the Warner Corporation. So you think about, some people might say the, NS, the, the NASL is kind of a, um, it's a prism on the future. And you think about things like corporate ownership, you know, is happening now, of, of star players who are almost bigger than the club, bigger than the game in some respects. Guess what, that's happening, isn't it? Uh, everybody knowing who the owner of the club is. Before the 1980s, who knew who the chairman was? You, you, you'd see his name in the corner of the programme and he'd write a few notes about last week's game, and that's it. Um, so it's all about this change in football culture. And part of this, of course, comes with Pelé, who signed in 1975 for the New York Cosmos. And it, it's massive. Five million people watch his debut on CBS. Uh, some people say it's 10 million, by the way, so there's a bit of an argument. But that's a hell of a lot of people for a game that's fairly under the radar. Who signs Pelé? This is a good one. Gordon Bradley, former Bradford Park Avenue player, <laughs> signs Pelly. Gordon's a really interesting career. Sunderland born, you know, I have to refer to my nose. Bradford Park Avenue, 1955 to 56, played 130 appearances at Carlisle. He then goes to Toronto and he plays for three clubs inside three years and doesn't move. So he plays for the Toronto Roma, Toronto Ukrainian, and Toronto City. It's very typical of the 1960s in America. Becomes player manager at the New York Cosmos, signs Pele, uh, is there 71 to 75, gets sacked, gets rehired, and then he's also the US coach for a while. So he has a really interesting career, and that's uh, that's old oh, Gordon, which none of us have probably heard of Gordon Bradley before, but they were. So I can actually say he started his career at Bradford Park Avenue and he ends it at New York Cosmos. Who would have thought that? Either? And this, this, the start of uh, bringing 
stars in It's a Tidal Wave. It just goes berserk. Talking about celebrity owners, there's Elton John. He becomes um, part owner of the LA Aztecs with George Best next to him. Um, in the top corner is Bobby Moore. You'll have to look at my nose. I'm not that clever to remember this one. He played for the San Antonio Thunder for a short while. Uh, in the bottom corner, this is a great photograph. That's Pele, Giorgio Chin Chinagia. I was struggling with that one. Who scored um, 193 goals in 213 appearances for the um, New York Cosmos. It's a record in the league. Another player who you will all know comes fourth in that league, so we'll get to him in a moment. Behind him is Tony Fields of Halifax, Barrow, Southport, Blackburn Rovers and Sheffield United. <laughs> you didn't recognise him. Behind him is Franz Beckenbauer. <laughs> who apparently had a good career in Germany. And as I say, it just keeps it keeps coming, and it's this it's this interesting juxtaposition between players. This is George Best uh, at the at the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. It doesn't really last in LA. It doesn't like LA. It thinks it's too. He was going to play New York, by the way. He was going to say he signed for Cosmos, and apparently he was a bit frightened by New York. He's from Belfast. <laughs> He's a bit frightened by. It. So he clears off to uh, LA. Didn't really like it. it. Was too hot apparently. Then goes to Fort Lauderdale, which he, he clearly didn't look at the thermometer there. But anyway. There's George in a fantastic, looking a bit like um, Partick Thistle in the sun. Uh, tremendous uh, shiny shorts. And the guy next to him, um, where has he gone now? I've lost, I've lost him on this. Billy, Billy Ronson of Blackpool, Cardiff, Wrexham and Barnsley. Again, it's this, it's this wonderful mix of, of stardom and, and, and mundane. And here's Gerd Muller, who signs... Why would, if you had a team called the Strikers, why wouldn't you sign the striker, uh, Gerd Muller, Der Bomber? And it's worth reading out. I had to revisit his, his figures, and they're absolutely astonishing. In domestic football, Gerd Muller scores 487 goals in 555 appearances. But it gets better. But for Germany, he scores 62 in 68. I mean, that's absolutely bloody amazing. You know, eat your, eat your heart out, Andy Cook. Eh? <laughs> you know? And perhaps one club that really, really epitomises what's going mad about the North American soccer league is the Philadelphia Atoms. The Philadelphia Atoms are owned by a conglomeration including Peter Frampton and Paul Simon. <laughs> Imagine the pretty much music. Um, the, shirts, the shirts are designed by, by a designer called Sal Cezani, and you can see Alan Ball and um, Johnny Giles flanking, um, flanking Trevor Francis. Uh, and they are fantastic shirts. They're a bit baseball-esque, aren't they? But they are marvellous, aren't they? Um, by the way, talking about the North American soccer league being a home for washed up old pros, well, in that pitch, you've got, of course, the, the first million pound footballer. At that point, he wasn't the first million pound footballer. He was 24 years old, and the previous, uh, about three months after his photographs taken, he goes back to England, signs for Nottingham Forest for a million quid. So it's not just about washed up footballers. Peter Beardsley plays, I think, for Vancouver Whitecaps as a 19 year old. So it's not as simple as people think. It's not, it's not all like that. But, however, we do like a good start, don't we? Let's, let's have a look at good old Johan Croy. He only played once for um, the New York Cosmos, and this is in the summer of 78. He was, he was free in the summer of 78 because he refused to play in the World Cup in Argentina because he was against the dictatorship in Argentina. Imagine what difference he might have made to the 1978 World Cup fan, but he refused to play, so he, he turned up in America. Uh, by the way, Ralph Lauren uh, designed the shirts in New York Cosmos. Well, why wouldn't he, eh? <laughs> Just see what it goes. Johan went on to play for, by the way, went on to play for the LA Aztecs and the Washington Whips. Played a lot of games for the Washington Whips. And uh, I've got a photograph of him coming up. There he is. Johan's the one on the right. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I've yet to get to the bottom of what this, um, what this thing is next to it, to be honest. It looks like a... Banana splits. Yeah, banana splits. That's a good one. <laughs> the banana splits in with Johan Cruyff in Washington. Uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a sentence, you know, we've got in the same place. And there's some fantastic kits in the NSL. I'll put again. I'll put all these online when Joe uploads the video onto YouTube. I'll, I'll send a link out, and you can see some of these pictures. This is a Colorado caribou, caribou, and around the middle of it, for those who can't see, is a fringe. It's fantastic. Imagine you better pull the player back, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. And of course, being America, guess what? Jaws. <laughs> so, so the San Diego Jaws. Jaws came out in '75, '76. They changed to San Diego Jaws. Just to make it more bizarre, that shirt is John Napier's shirt, Bradford City centre half and manager who nipped across to play a few seasons in the North American Soccer League. So, John Napier and Jaws. 
God. And the Chicago Sting, um, named after the film The Sting, of course, 1973, I think. And Mr. T, who is born and bred in, Cal in, in Chicago, appears. I don't know why I've not been able to get the bottle of this, what, what he's doing there. Clearly, he didn't play with that bling around his neck. Um, and again, I promised you, Mr. T and the North American Soccer League, there he is, a random photograph of the internet, but that's great. Perhaps the biggest star, who turns out to be the biggest star of the North American Soccer League, in some respects, overshadows Pele, is Rodney Marsh. Rodney Marsh goes to the Tampa Bay Rounders and he's an absolute sensation out there. Because I think America gave him the freedom to do what the bloody hell he wanted, and he did do what the bloody hell he wanted. There's some fantastic stories of Rodney Marshall. I mean, that's his quote at the start, birds, booze and books, and it is kind of tongue-in-cheek, but probably not that tongue-in-cheek, no, Rod. Um, Rodney Marsh is called into the office one day by the uh, owner of the Tampa Bay Rounders, and he said, Rodney, we're playing, we're playing the New York Cosmos next week. How are we going to counter these guys? And he says, leave it with me. It's not a problem. So on the Friday... Giorgio Kinlagia, uh, Pelé and Franz Beckenbauer fly into Tampa Bay Airport for a pre-match um, press conference. They're met at the airport by a stretch limo with three glamour models, a bottle of Shiva's Regal, and never seen again until kickoff. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and the Tampa Bay Rounders win 3-1. <laughs> but the Tampa Bay Rounders are absolutely fantastic. Um, here we go. This is... This is where things get a little bit gaudy. Um, a little bit gaudy, and yes, uh, Jasper Carrot. What's he doing there? Jasper Carrot is recording Carrot Gets Rounded, a documentary in 1979. And there he is with the Woundies, who are the uh, cheerleaders of the Rowdies. Um, they called their supporters Fannies. And you could get a car sticker that said Fannies on board. They had an open day. And yes, they called it a Fannies open day. <laughs> And there's Derek Smethers of Chelsea and Millwall. Chelsea and Millwall, imagine that, the new den, sorry, the old den, the old den to Tampa, to Tampa Bay. Looking a bit perplexed at the fact he's opened it. Perhaps it's not what we expected. No one knows. But joking apart, oh, there's a, you can have the Tampa Bay Rounders, by the way, on the, in Subutio, which is great. And by the way, the, do you know that the biggest worldwide supplier of Subutio lives in Rose? So we should get, we should get them down next season for a talk. That'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? So you could have the Tampa Bay Rounders against Bradford Park Avenue or something like that in Subutio, but yeah, so there you go. Or you could get the opposition players met at the airport or something, I don't know. So but joking apart about the NSL, one of the interesting facts is the, the younger players who do go and play there, the Americans start to get given a chance later on in the NSL, and it's a really innovative league. They really think about what can we do differently. And part of this is about the fact that America is just so far from everywhere else, it's almost so far in the mind from everywhere else in the sporting sense that they feel like they've got the freedom to do what they like. And I think the Americans don't like being told what to do, to be honest, as well. I think they just like the idea of doing different things. And a tie, it's like kissing your sister. That's an actual quote from one of the NESL um, uh, executives. So they come up with all sorts of things. And some of them work, some of them don't. In 1967, it's six points for a win. Three points for a draw and a bonus point for every goal. So you could probably get 12 points if you want, couldn't you, if you thrash something. Then they decided in 74 to abolish draws, bring a penalty shootout in and give four points to the winner. So you draw a match and then you win it. So you're a winning draw, so you get four points instead of three. So it's, it's not the easiest, is it? Uh, in 1975, they bring in 15 minutes of sudden death and penalties, which has, happens all the time now in football, doesn't it? And in 1977, famously, penalties are replaced by the 35-yard shootout, which was, I think, was really interesting. I think that had some legs in it, if you excuse the pun. Um, it really did. And I, I, I think if the Americans hadn't invented that, that might have been taken more seriously. And, and the English come up with all the French or the Italians, the might, FIFA might go, OK, well, let's have a look at this. But because it's the Americans, it, oh, no, no, too gaudy. In 1977, the NSL hits its real height, its peak, and... and Pelly retires. Of course, by the way, when Pelly arrived in, let me just rewind a bit, I forgot, I forgot to read my notes, that's the problem. When Pelly arrived, he, he had offers from Juventus, he had offers from Real Madrid, and the quote was given, it's a fantastic quote, is that he could have won championships at Real Madrid, he could have won championships at Juventus, but he can win an entire country with the New York Cosmos, and he did. He did win an entire country. And when he retires in 1977, it throws it down. This is in New York, he plays Santos, and the New York Times comes up with a great headline, Even God Cried. 
which is marvellous. But it kind of was the peak of the NASL. After that, it was very, very difficult to carry on with, with what was going on. And part of that reason is, well, part of it is that a lot of the owners of other clubs will all want to have a Pele, which everybody can't. There's only one Pele, there's only one New York Cosmos. The New York Cosmos are the best in arms of the league. They're the worst in arms of the league because they kind of kill all the opposition. So everybody tries to buy in players from all over the place, but at the same time, they're filling the squads out with, with good footballers. And one of the footballers, it turns out, is Jim Fryer. Anybody knows why? Why is Jim Fryer uh, famous? Well, the fastest goal in history. He shoots, he scores after four seconds. The fastest goal in football league history, Bradford Park Avenue against Tramia Rovers in April 1964. I wasn't there on the grounds that I was less than a month old. Uh, but my dad was there. And I asked my dad about I remember asking my dad about it, and he said, no chance. He was walking along uh, down, you know, the, the, the dugout, but well, we probably don't most of them. Underneath the main stand, there was, there was like a paddock, and he was walking on there as they kicked off. And he said, Jim Fry kicks off, passes to his teammate, and sets off running. His teammate plays it out to the winger, who plays it in, that Jim Fry scores. He said it was fast, but it wasn't four seconds. It's more like ten. But the referee said it's four, so therefore Jim, Jim Fry goes into the record books as the fastest ever goal scorer in, in history. Uh, uh, where are we? Baltimore comments next. Let's have a picture of the Baltimore comments. Again, you won't be able to see this, but I wanted to put this up and we'll put it online because third right at the back is Alan Gilliver. That's uh, played an awful lot of times for Bradford City. John Napier again, bottom left. He's next to the fellow with a tremendous afro. Um, and Bradford City players are all over the place, actually. Uh, we've got Nick over a page. The Las Vegas Quicksilvers. First run back is Eusebio. Okay, we know all about him. Not interested. Second right is Jim Fryer, who's by now a coach. Front second left is Trevor Hockey. And the third right is Jerry Ingram. Anybody remembers Jerry Ingram? An excellent striker we signed from Blackpool in, the, I think, about 73. And he scored twice against Blackpool, ironically, in the FA Cup on his debut. 119 goals in 201 games. He is a 1983 soccer ball winner with uh, the Tulsa Roughnecks. He plays for Minnesota, Portland. That's a picture of playing for Portland. And I'm going to attempt to show you a video. We've never, we've never got anywhere with these videos, have we? But we're going to have a go at this. Come on. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on. Yay! So this is, um, this is somebody versus somebody. Um, this is Fort Lauderdale against Tulsa. Fort Lauderdale opened the scoring, and then uh, here come. Here comes Tulsa, one all. Here comes a flick on him. Ronnie goes to the centre of the box and bang. 2-1, Ronnie Butcher. Here comes Ronnie again. Bit of a mess up there, but Ronnie's going to take advantage, isn't he? See you later, son. So that's Ronnie scoring again. And there's another goal and some good... Oh, this is a classic own goal. Um, you must watch this online because this is bloody hilarious. Hang on, listen for the booing. We can't really hear it. Some good boo in there. I just have to find some coverage of. Um, and who else to. Who? Why wouldn't Bobby Campbell turn up in the North American Soccer League? Yes, he did. Vancouver Whitecaps. Um, Ronnie. Uh, Bobby, sorry. Bobby, 1978, between Sheffield United and Huddersfield Town, he turns up at the Vancouver Whitecaps. He scores nine goals in 13 appearances. Typical Bobby Campbell. Probably in nine bars in 25 minutes. He signs for. Um, Signs for, he signed for Bradford City across from Brisbane, so he disappeared across to Australia uh, the summer after. And we signed him in 1979, and as I say, the rest is history. It really is history with Bobby, isn't it? And one of the things I really wanted to do was revisit Paul First's excellent book about Bobby and, and, get some, and get some really interesting quotes about his time in America, but I realised this talk's only 45 minutes long. Um, Bobby probably couldn't fill hours and hours and hours of uh, talks, but yeah, it's great to see Bobby Campbell appear in amongst it all. Now... The 1984 Olympic Games goes to Los Angeles and the crowds at the are massive. The biggest ever crowds for a soccer tournament in, in the Olympic history. It's enormous. FIFA really take note of this and think, oh, oh, that's interesting. However, at the same time, the North American Soccer League is collapsing because everybody wants to be Pele. All the owners want to be rich. The fans want to be wowed. Nobody wants to win. Nobody wants to build a solid support base. Nobody wants to bring on local players. It's just we want to make that immediate step. We all, all want to be the New York Cosmos, but in any league, you know, there's got to be winners and losers, and, and it kind of does. It just doesn't work, and it's it's all built on sand. And this comes back actually, if I, next season or the season after, I'll talk about the MLS. And this is 
the old basis of the MLS is based on the failure of the North American Soccer League. So the 1994 Olympics is a massive, massive success for the Olympics, but it's a terrible thing for time, uh, football in America. By the time of 85, in the North American Soccer League, there's a Port Lauderdale strikers and Toronto left, and that's it. All the rest have gone. And they've joined the... A, a lot of the clubs have disappeared into indoor soccer because it's, it's just easier and it's better for the weather and the, the capacities are lower and... Uh, and it's just really much more popular and easy, you know, a lot, lot cheaper to, to put on. So the, the entire thing collapses and the North America Soccer League goes down. But at the same time, and this is the uh, this is a real kick in the nuts to the Americans, Colombia should have held the 1980 Columbia. We're going to keep coming back to Colombia, though, in these talks. Colombia should have held the 1986 World Cup. But for various reasons, economic reasons and, and political instability, they can't. So it gets put open for a, for, for, for someone to host it. And the, the FIFA want to keep it in the Americas. So the Americas think, oh, okay, we'll go for this. And apparently they're very blasé about it. They think they're going to get it. They think it's a walk in the park, man. However, they kind of sell it as come to come to America and save our league. That's not a great pitch for, for FIFA. It really isn't. I mean, even if, even if you think that actually sending it to Mexico is almost too safe an option. I can understand why FIFA didn't do it. And apparently the document that the Americans gave to FIFA was very flimsy. As I say, it was very sort of, they, they really thought they got it in the bag and it doesn't happen. And it, the fact that it's given to Mexico <laughs> with, right next door is, is a real kick in the, in the nuts for the Americans. And I think after that, a lot of people think, oh, to hell with soccer. These, you know, let these guys go play their game. We'll, we'll concentrate on our stuff. So it reinforces this idea that soccer's not an American game. It's not about those guys. It's about them guys out there. And, that's it, really. Football collapses. However, it doesn't, and it never does. And then what the Americans do is they go away and learn their lessons, and they start thinking about it, and they launch the bid for the 1994 World Cup, which they get, of course. And is it 94? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah. Uh, yeah, the 94 World Cup. They go away and... Uh, sorry, you can't that image very good. They go away and really learn the lessons, and they re-bid for the World Cup and get it. And part of that bid is to set up a proper professional sports league that is based on solid foundations, building core supports, downtown stadiums, American football, American players rather, and academies and all the things that they never did in the past. And crucially also, they would absolutely line up 100%. Their ducks in line with the FIFA rules and regulations. It would be exactly the same game that everybody else was playing. And this is crucial. This completely changes soccer in America and soccer history in America. And it leads to the MLS, which at some point in the near future I'll talk to you about. And this picture, which you can't see, is a pretty bad, it's a really good picture on my laptop. It's terrible on Keith's projector. It's of, um, <laughs> that's in the blue. It's of the march to the match of uh, Orlando City from just the other side of the pandemic, actually. And uh, it's a bit contrived. And it, this is what American soccer's kind of like it feels a bit contrived it's you know banging drums and it's flares but as someone who was caught up last saturday in, a, in an ambush after the um don't cast rovers game there are some good things about being a bit old people just run past you as they're chucking bricks at each other and i, I kind of reflected on that and thought you know i'd rather be caught up in a lot of a lot of fun and and color and excitement than some some used spread bricks each other, but I suppose we've all done that in the past, haven't we? So that's next time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> not throwing bricks each other, that's not next time. <laughs> next time, <laughs> yeah, history of yeah, history of football violence. Um, next time we've got a talk on my grandfather, the FA Cup winning chairman, uh, by Mick Kennedy's cousin. Uh, is it John? It is John, yes, yeah, it is John Kennedy. And that is on the 22nd of April. Uh, a great day to have it because that is the anniversary of Bradford City's first ever appearance in the FA Cup, the nil nil draw down in at the Crystal Palace. It's a great time to have it. I can't remember who we were playing that day. Um, Gillingham. Gillingham. Oh, another one. Yeah. Gillingham, a team of won't bring any away to support Bradford City as 1 0. Um, yeah, so look forward to that. Thanks for listening. I um, hope you enjoyed it. And, and as I say, Joe's filming away like mad. I'll upload all these images onto it so you'll be able to see some of them better. So please do watch. So thank you. Well, I'd like to say, I don't know about else, but I'm genuinely like now fully enthused about uh, North American soccer. And I think that genuinely did lift a lot of the stigma 
I bet he did. Left a lot of the stick on North Rain Soccer. Cheers, Dan. Cheers to Joe as well for filming. Joe, one and Paul. Well done, Joe. Well, our next spent the next point of our lecture is the 22nd, a bit of a gap, 27th of April, um, before the Yeah, Thanks a lot for Dave. Really, really good. A masterclass, I would say. Yeah. Well done. Cheers. <laughs>